Okay. While the story may have been fictitious, the content of what we're going to be discussing today is very serious. So before we get started, I want to take time to acknowledge all of the organizations that made today possible. Let us first extend our thanks to the Princeton Young Democratic Socialist Association for organizing this event to begin with. I also want to make sure to acknowledge the Princeton Progressive Law Society for providing free copies of Professor Chomsky's new book, The Consequences of Capitalism. A thank you to some of our supporting organizations, such as Unidad Latina and Acción, which organizes and supports Latin workers in the New Jersey area. I highly recommend you all look into it as it's an organization um, that's committed to the principles that we're gonna be discussing today. And last, but certainly not least, I wanna say thank you to Wig Clio for providing the food and refreshments that'll be held after the end of this event. With all that being said, I urge you all to engage your expert of spirits and attend the meetings of some of these organizations. The Princeton YDSA in particular, focuses on tackling societal challenges, the push for workplace democracy, eco-socialist change, and the mobilization of young people, and the organization of dialogues such as this. We hold our meetings every Thursday at 5 p.m. in the Wig Clio basement. One of the organizations that I actually just mentioned wants to do a quick, uh, uh, I guess, briefing with the, org with the group here to let you all know about what they do, as well as where you can meet them and support them if you're interested. I'll pass the mic off. Hey, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for the space. And well, I just wanna open up this conversation and let you guys know how we usually open up at the meetings. And we usually say unity is power. So when I say unity, can you guys say power? Unity is, come on, we can do better. Unity is, unity is. So uh, I'm Jorge Torres. I was undocumented for seven years. I'm one of the organizers with Unidad Latina en Acción, a nonprofit organization that is here locally in Princeton. We fight and advocate for immigrants' rights. We are organizing a May Day this May 1st here in Princeton uh, at six o'clock. Well, one of our demands is actually uh, workers' rights. We are against and um, of abolishing ICE as well. We are uh, saying not to work we are claiming the right to organize in workplaces. We are saying not to wage theft. And first and not all is the demand of papers for all and amnesty for all and to stop this criminalization to workers and criminalization to all the community. So we wanted to make the time and take the opportunity to invite you all to come and join us and let us know if you can, if we can come with you and the community and the documented community can come with you. So thank you very much for the opportunity and I hope we can see you around and I hope you can join. We have some flyers outside and I hope you can join us to be part of this incredible day, which is uh, Workers' Rights, International Workers' Rights Day. Thank you so much. Come on, let's give that another round of applause. That was wonderful, that was wonderful, that was wonderful. Okay then, now for the reason we've all, got, we've all gathered here today, a quick bio. As the father of modern linguistics and a prominent activist, historian, cognitive scientist, and political commentator, Professor Chomsky has written over 100 books, and countless articles 
on the complexities of language and modern political economy. He has also been recognized with numerous awards and honors for his valuable contributions, to both linguistics and politics. Over the years, he has been a fierce, fierce advocate for workers' rights, a staunch bulwark against imperialism and media concentration, as well as an advocate for libertarian socialism. Please help me in welcoming Professor Emeritus of Linguistics and Philosophy at MIT, Laureate Professor of Linguistics and Chair of the Agnes Nelms Hari Program in Environment and Social Justice at the University of Arizona, the highly esteemed Professor Noam Chomsky. Pleased to be with you. All right, thank you so much for being here. Um, we're gonna start out with a few organizer questions that we prepared for you, and then we're gonna okay. hand it off to the audience, if that's okay. That's great. Right, well, uh, okay, so our first question is, well, to give some context, there are several different student groups, um, you know, working for certain causes at Princeton right now. One of them is Divest Princeton, uh, which aims for the university to divest from fossil fuels. Uh, YDSA at Princeton is currently working on bringing attention to campus workers issues, things like wages lagging behind cost of living and the restriction of free expression when it comes to no strike clauses uh, in Princeton's union contracts. Um, could you first give us your thoughts on the role of students in organizing and how to deal with the imbalance of power between institutions and students or workers? Well, we can, I should say that I spent a year in Princeton a long time ago, 1958, 57, 58. Nobody was raising questions like this. The idea was almost unimaginable. Uh, that kind of answers your question. Students have become active, engaged, changed the world considerably. There's nothing new about that. Uh, students, people your age, happen to be at a point in life where you're almost uniquely free, free from parental control, free from the exigencies of putting food on the table tomorrow, gives a certain latitude that is pretty rare in human life. So over the years, it's often been the case that students were in the lead and uh, young people, students in the lead and leading to significant social, political, economic change. And it's very heartening to think about the changes that have taken place in Princeton since the year I spent there. Of course, been back many times since, but uh, this is uh, typical of what's happened in most of the world. I mean, I was at the time back in the late 50s, and in fact, most of my life at MIT, 1950s, absolutely quiescent, nothing happening. Uh, 10 years later, MIT was actually student body was taken over by a, was a political activism and engagement had increased so extensively on campus in those years that the president of the student body was a active a political radical, Mike Albert still is still very effective went on to do all sorts of other things. He took the student presidency on a, a position on a platform so radically you can practically believe it had a big effect on MIT, on the environment, on others. And it goes on. So what can you do? Well, what students have been doing very effectively for the past uh, several decades, just more of it. And uh, how do you deal with the imbalance of power? By working to reverse it. Uh, that's hard work. It's basically a kind of special case of class struggle, uh, always hard and difficult. 
uh, but there are no simple answers. There's no formulas, no algorithm, just uh, the kinds of things that the that those of you who have spoken so far have raised. They, these are the issues we have to deal with. You in your way, me in my way, reach out to communities, see if they can join us, uh, invigorate us, give their own ideas, move forward to uh, create the kinds of new institutions that can allow us to uh, create a much better, a much more just, a much more free society and world. We know where we roughly where we want to go, know basically the ways to proceed, just have to work harder to uh, implement what the options are, whatever particular issues you want to concentrate and focus on. So no secrets, uh, just work harder. Thank you, Professor. So the preface of the next question, the sort of global system that I think everyone in this room is used to is one that's based within the idea of strong states and capitalist economies. And it's no secret that that translates into our um, classwork and academia. So it's the only model that most of us are familiar with. Yet, Many young people are anxious about things like the climate emergency, economic inequality, and democratic backsliding. But they don't know what systems could potentially be implemented to stop these things. For those of you, for those who may not be uh, familiar with your ideas and your beliefs, could you talk about alternative economic and political models that you think are important to consider in dealing with these challenges? Well, let's start with uh, the most central question. How do people spend their lives? Uh, for most young people today, the, the high aspiration is to get a decent job, a regular paying job that you can, where you can be more or less confident that you'll have a paycheck tomorrow and it'll be enough to live on. There is an alternative. You could not have a job. You could live a precarious existence. A very large part of the population uh, uh, is in that situation increasingly. In fact, a part of the programs of basically class war of the past generation that are misleadingly called neoliberalism are designed to create a, what's sometimes called a precariat. Uh, people who live a precarious existence, uh, maybe will be called to work tomorrow, maybe not. Maybe it'll be called for a, a, a double time tomorrow. So you have to do that, maybe nothing. Uh, hand to mouth, actually probably a majority of the population lives pretty much from paycheck to paycheck. A lot of it was precarious. So the aspiration is try to get a steady job. Well, think about that for a minute. There was a time not very long ago when the idea of having a steady job was considered an utter abomination. That means that you spend your waking life in service to a master who has almost total control over you. That's having a job. Uh, he tells you when uh, you're allowed to talk to your friend for five minutes, you can take a break and have a cup of coffee now and not some other time. If you're, a, uh, if you're an Amazon worker, uh, here's the path you have to take between two positions, you take a different path, you get a demerit, uh, your job's in th threatened. If you're a United Parcel, United uh, Parcel worker, truck driver, if you stop for uh, 
couple minutes uh, when you're not supposed to, you get a notice saying, sorry, can't do that. And you're basically a, a servant to a master for most of your working life. There was a time not long ago when that was considered an intolerable attack on human rights and fundamental dignity. That was the attitude of the American workforce in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, the idea of being subordinated to a master for any part of your life, certainly not all of most of your waking life, was just considered beyond intolerable. In fact, this position was so uh, so common, so natural, that it was even a slogan of the Republican Party, not today's Republican Party, of course, Lincoln's Republican Party. Uh, the, the idea of having a job was considered tolerable only if it was temporary till you could become a free person again. Now that was in individualist terms, but the working people were thinking about it in collective terms. The first great labor organization, Knights of Labor, developed late 19th century, was based on the principle that those who work in the mills should own them. That was true of both men and women, the so-called factory girls, young women driven to the mills from the farms were organized, had their own literature, a very lively press, same ideas. And it extended beyond the working class to the uh, agricultural population was of course mostly an agricultural country then. Uh, farmers in the Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas were organizing at the time to free themselves from the control of Northeastern uh, bankers, uh, market managers, organizing to run their own affairs, uh, economic, uh, social, and not individual. They were aiming for a cooperative commonwealth where they would work together to create a life based on working people controlling their own affairs, all of them. Knights of Labor and the, that was the authentic popular mo populist movement, not what's called populism today. Populist movement and the Knights began to move towards uh, unification. If they had succeeded, it would be a very different country. Well, the United States happens to be somewhat unusual among industrial democracies in that it has an unusually powerful business class and also a highly class conscious business class. One of the reasons why the United States is off the spectrum of industrial societies in many respects regarding social welfare and so on. You all know about that, I don't have to review it. Well, this, we've also had a very violent labor history, unusually so, for the same reason. These efforts around the turn of the century, 19th, 20th century, were put down by extreme uh, state and private violence. Uh, the labor movement had survived up until the Wilson administration. You know Woodrow Wilson very well. He launched a massive repression, so-called Red Scare, in the aftermath of the First World War which virtually destroyed the labor movement. It was crushed, uh, very racist, lots of uh, lynching, other atrocities, uh, into, uh, independent thought was suppressed, independent media, uh, very violent, brutal period. So there was a socialist party. It was essentially crushed, uh, never recovered. There was some revival in the 1930s with industrial organizing, CIO, CIO and so on, but it never really recovered. Well, compare the highest aspiration today and what was considered a, an abomination a century earlier. I should say this is not just in the United States. Same was happening in Europe. In Europe, 
the First World War uh, broke the illusion, the illusions about uh, the uh, what, are, what are called liberal economic doctrines that the market is uh, the perfect system. You have to just sub sub subordinate yourself to it. Uh, First World War indicated, made people understand very clearly that if you want to get something done effectively, you're going to have to do it through the coordinated activity of the, at then the state authorities. Uh, that led to a, a break in, a breakdown of illusions about the capitalist system led to great efforts after the immediate aftermath of the war to develop a, a, a really a real profound far-reaching attack on the basis of capitalist autocracy uh, workers organizations take over factories in italy other countries on the continent uh, in england uh, Guild socialism was essentially an effort to, for workers to take over industry, run it themselves. Uh, this was a major assault. It was beaten back in different ways. In Italy, it was beaten back simply by fascism, outright fascism, which finally managed to crush the working class. Uh, in England, working people had achieved enough rights so couldn't move to direct fascism. Other means were developed. Uh, the idea, primarily the idea that the economy has to be taken out of public control. The economy is put in the hands of technocrats, called themselves scientists, pure science. Economics was the pure science. And they would be free from public influence and control. And since you can't argue with science, they would run it and the popular movements should turn to some something else, not efforts to in, intervene in the economy, usually turns to one or another form of austerity, uh, which happens not by accident to support the ruling classes and to oppress the rest. We've seen one or another form of that for the last century. Well, class war moves up and back never ends. In the United States, there was a big change in the 1930s, the Deep Depression. That's my childhood. I remember it very well. There was large-scale organizing based on revived working class militancy, led to the demo social democratic reforms called the New Deal reforms. Uh, uh, Europe, meanwhile, descended to fascism. Uh, the uh, uh, business classes were bitterly opposed, couldn't do much during the Deep Depression, was on hold during the war, uh, though uh, business was given authority to run the wartime economy, should recognize that that was done with considerable self-consciousness. You read... Uh, Henry Stimson, Secretary of War. In those days, we were honest enough to have a war department. Now we call it a defense department. There was a, war, a Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, was one of the leading architects of the uh, political economy of the period. He pointed out clearly that he said virtually in these words that in a capitalist economy, if you want to achieve anything, you have to make sure that the business classes gain from it. That's our system. You want something done, you bribe the rich and the powerful and who own the economy to do it for you. No other way. It's very pertinent at the moment in many respects. Uh, after the war, a major assault began against the social democratic reforms, took many, many directions, didn't really reach uh, fruition until the late 1970s. Late Carter, Reagan came along, launched the war, uh, as along with Thatcher in England, you end up with the neoliberal assault against the population, 
40 years of severe repression of the general population. You're familiar with the details, don't have to go through it. Now we have reached a point where, to go back to what I started with, the, asp the aspirations that were considered intolerable and abominable a century or so ago are now considered high aspirations. So what kind of society should we look forward to? I think the kind of society that working people and radical farmers were developing and thinking about and moving towards before the century long assault against the population and popular rights took place. And we can do that. It's not, it's right below the surface. The idea that you should spend your waking life in the service of a master is as abominable today as it was then. You have to lift the veil and see that there are options and alternatives. You can have the takeover of productive forces by the workers involved. Some call it economic democracy, some call it workers' control, various names. Communities can be become democratic functioning communities with participants. They can integrate and work together. You can reach a cooperative commonwealth of the kind that farmers and workers aspire to in our own history and in uh, other industrial countries as well and in various different ways in other places. So take uh, Brazil, the uh, second major country in the Western Hemisphere. It's the home of the largest popular movement, I think, anywhere in the world. The landless workers movement takes over abandoned land, works on them, and is developing a cooperative society cooperative uh, uh, agriculture-based in, in, industries like dairy and others run collectively. Very large, very effective movement under terrific pressure and repression, of course, but fighting on. Same is happening elsewhere. These movements throughout the world should be working together in solidarity, recognizing that we're in the midst of a global class war taking different forms in different places have common aspirations can work towards developing a social order that is authentically democratic and participatory based on principles of mutual aid mutual concern solidarity cooperation the ideals are clear we have some idea various ways of pursuing them I think those are whatever name one wants to give them. It happens to have a traditional name. Traditionally, it's called libertarian socialism or anarchism. Uh, give it some other name if you like. But those ideas are, I don't think, far below the surface and being efforts to implement them in various ways in different places. My feeling is that's the kind of social order we should be trying to create. We have our own problems here. Brazil, they have different problems. Italy, different ones. But fundamentally, the same concerns are animate. They should be animating the mass of the population to move towards free and just society with direct participation in making the decisions that matter in people's lives. That doesn't seem utopian. There are ways to reach it in ways that are not beyond imagination. So my feeling is those are the general guidelines that we should be thinking about. Thank you, Professor. At the core of what you just said um, was the imbalance of power between the civilian population and the state. And we've seen some of the most uh, disgusting and brutal uses of state violence against minority populations, specifically here in the United States. Um, after the uh, murder of Tyree Nichols in January, there were many protests in the United States demanding justice related to police brutality, as well as accountability for those responsible for those crimes. Um, you've written before about your libertarian socialist leanings. 
but how exactly does that relate um, to your perspective on this new abolition movement, the defunding of the police, the potential abolition of the police and things within that sphere? Well, let's take the idea of defunding the police. That meant different things to different left activist groups. So you listen to, say, Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, many of the leaders of Black Lives Matter. What they meant by defending the police was re removing the police from activities which are none of their business, leaving them to police activities. Uh, that means if you look at what police actually do, overwhelming majority of it is things that aren't police activities. Uh, domestic problems, uh, overdoses, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, things where you, the community, community activism and involvement should be directly responsible. Police have no business there. So that's defunding the police. At the same time, improving police salaries, police training, bring them in along, make them part of the movement towards greater social justice. That's one interpretation of defund the police, and I think the right one. And if that can be, of course, the, uh, the idea that you just eliminate the police is strongly opposed, particularly in minority communities, black communities that crime where, where communities that are what are called crimogenic uh, designed socially and uh, economically so that crime is one of the only ways to survive. In those communities, in the short term, they want police better than that. They want to eliminate the crimogenic aspects of the communities. Well, all of these things uh, can should fall together in a, I think, constructive, progressive form of revising, reshaping uh, security systems so that they're more they're popularly controlled and direct to the kind of things that are of concern to people in the communities, not involved in things which involve, which require uh, different kinds of uh, engagement and involvement, things ranging from mental health to domestic problems to uh, uh, alcoholism, other things. That's not, none of that has to do with the police. Well, that requires major social changes. The United States, we have an enormous problem, enormous problem of lack of care for uh, people with one or another form of problem in their lives could be uh, uh, enormous poverty. It shouldn't exist in the richest country in the world. Uh, problems of uh, depression. Uh, we have a country which is under such extreme uh, social collapse that it's even, as you know, has an increase in mortality that just doesn't happen among uh, societies, except in times of uh, war or pestilence. In the United States, it happens in peacetime and great prosperity, actual decline in, mor in, in mortality, mostly among white working class, um, age, 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 working class ages of mostly white males, not all males. That's a indication of social decay of extreme, of extreme nature. And it's only one aspect. There's no resources for mental health problems. They've almost disappeared. They never were very much. Uh, the uh, punitive rather than preventive action uh, policies towards drug use or another aspect 
all of these things are illustrations of a dysfunctional social order and the problem of police is embedded within it the whole uh, the roots of the whole social disorder have to be dealt with before you can have a constructive sensible discussion about the nature of whatever security is needed for the benefit of the community Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, in the interest of time, I want to start us. I want us to start off with the uh, Q and A portion. I see the crowd is very anxious to interact with you. Um, so we're going to be passing off the microphone, and you all have the opportunity to ask your questions to Professor Chomsky. Please try to keep them brief. In the interest of time, please uh, raise your hand if you're interested. Um, we had an online forum, but we think we're okay with in person. Thank you. Hello, thank you for speaking with us today. I'm just wondering the way that you talk about changing attitudes of workers towards an acceptance, I guess, of conditions um, and going back thinking about um, working being unconscionable. Uh, could you talk about media and maybe mass media and how that may have played a role in changing these perceptions? Thank you. Well, what are the mass media? What's their nature, their institutional structure? That's the place to start with. Uh, the mass media are major corporations, most of them parts of mega corporations, uh, like they're a business, like other businesses. They have a product, they sell it to a market. The market is advertisers, it's basically the source of income. Uh, the product is you. The product is uh, readers, viewers. And the idea is that the businesses are selling audiences to other major businesses, uh, very closely linked to government. There's a intimate relation between the, uh, just as Henry Stimson pointed out, between the uh, uh, the capitalist elite and the political elite, they interact, interchange, and so on. So when you look at that in institutional structure, what do you expect to happen? What you expect to find is a media product that uh, conforms substantially to the interests of the sellers, the buyers, the state institutions that are linked to them. and. Uh, when you study the actual output of the media, it's pretty much what you find. There's by now substantial literature on this. You can look at it. My co-author and I, Ed, Edward Herman, the late Edward Herman, between us individually and jointly have published probably thousands of pages of uh, illustrations of how this works. Many other people have as well. So there's a lot of material you can look at, evaluate, see if it's convincing and so on. And I think one of the effects, one of the roles of the media, it's not even, I don't even think it's not even conscious, it's so deeply built in, is to support and enhance the conception that the only way to live, the only way is to be the servant of a master or else be a master, that's it. There are no alternatives. Well, there are plenty of alternatives. They're tried and implemented and sometimes work, but you don't read about them. Uh, that shows up in this particular domain and every other domain as well. So the uh, I should say that there are serious problems in this media system at the moment, things we should be concerned about. Uh, the media system has from my view, it's my point of view, it's serious flaws of the kind that I mentioned, but it also has positive function. It's the way of getting some kind of under information about things that are going on domestically and in the world, maybe skewed by propaganda, but at least there's 
the basic material there. Well, that's declining. The advertising model on which, which was the business model of the media is seriously declining with the shift of advertising to the internet. Uh, this has already had major effects. One effect is that quality local newspapers have almost disappeared. Boston Globe, where I lived most of my life, was a major newspaper, serious one. Had the best reporting on the Central American atrocities in the 80s in the entire country. And I knew I was quite friendly with the editor and many of the leading journalists. Gone. Now it's wire services and local news. Same with the San Francisco Chronicle, Detroit Free Press, uh, Los Angeles Tribune, uh, Los Angeles Times, many others. Uh, that decline in local quality media has greatly impoverished the general uh, cultural level in the country. Uh, another thing that's happened is that especially young people are not even looking at newspapers, even at television. A study came out recently of Gen Z, 1997 birth today. Practically none read the newspapers or watch television. In fact, even looking at Facebook is declining. People are getting their news from young people from Instagram and TikTok and so on. It's a real impoverishment. We have to enrich. And here, if we go back to the labor organizations, which have been pretty much smashed during the massive cold war, uh, class war of recent years. Labor movements were not just uh, at places where people tried to wage, raise wages, or they were a full life. 1930s, you join a union, that's your life. Adult education, cultural programs, uh, classical music, Shakespeare plays, uh, uh, social events. It was an entire social, cultural, and political life all around the unions. Well, with the decline of the union movement and the attack on it as part of the savage class war of the last couple of decades, all of that's disappeared. People are left to, for something else. Uh, often leaves them prey to demagogues, to uh, uh, social media of the kind that disinform, mislead uh, mega churches, other forms of organized irrationality. Very dangerous effect. Uh, one of the purpose goals of the uh, activists today, as in the past, should be to encourage the development of and participate if possible in the development of organizations based on labor unions are the obvious ones based on people's life's work and life's commitment, which will reconstruct and enliven and enrich the cultural life and structure that was in the past built around the labor movement and should be again. Otherwise, it's going to be a society of disinformation, fakery, lies, distortion, and so on, which people are left alone to hang out there in isolation to try to find their way. Well, that's a form of social and political control similar to totalitarianism, even without the black shirts. Thank you, Professor. In the interest of time, we want to move on so we can get some more questions. Who else would like to ask one? Good evening, Professor Chomsky. It's a pleasure to be able to interact with you today. I was wondering, as a prospective politician, how does one navigate an institution like Capitol Hill without enabling US imperialism? 
Well, you can, if you can make it to Capitol Hill, you can not only cast your vote, but use your influence to undermine and eliminate the imperial power. And there are people who are doing it. It's not easy. Uh, happens every day. Uh, let's, uh, the uh, authorization to use military force uh, provided by Congress after 9-11 has been not totally withdrawn, but at least attenuated. Well, that's a step. Uh, take another example, just the last couple of days, uh, Jamal Bowman and Bernie Sanders have introduced legislation to uh, reconsider US aid to Israel because of its violation of US law, which bans military aid to military units engaged in systematic human rights violations. That's quite serious. One of the bases for US imperial power in the Middle East has been the highly militarized Israeli state regarded as a core strategic asset and base for US power ever since 1967 when policy towards Israel shifted radically. Okay, that's a move. And there are many others like it. Uh, so you're not, you're not, there are options within the political system. They're going to be resisted or very bitterly, but they're there and they're examples of people in fact pursuing them. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Uh, we'll give it to the next person. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Chomsky. It's an honor to have you speak here today. Um, you've led two professional lives, one as an activist and one as an academic. Could you give any advice to people about to embark on their career on how to balance our obligation to improve the world and the desire to do intellectually interesting work in situations where those two values might conflict, whether it pertains to choosing a career or allocating your time within one? Thank you again. That's a tough one, which is it's a large part of my life. It has been all my life, in fact. Uh, there's no answer. I mean, there are the intellectual work is exciting, challenging, uh, can be of great significance for understanding the world, human beings, what kind of creatures we are, what we do about it. That's one part of life. The other part is direct engagement. I don't know of any way to balance them. You just do what seems important at the moment. It's a conflict constantly. There are 24 hours a day. You can't switch it to 96 hours, even if you'd like to. So you make compromises, you cut here and there. That's not simple. Try to also live a fulfilling life yourself with your family, your friends, and so on. There's no answers. You have to find your own way. Thank you again, Professor Chomsky. Uh, let's give it to another audience member. Thanks so much again for joining us, uh, Professor Chomsky, today. Um, <clears throat> my question is relating to the word socialism. And as a Cuban American, I think that word is, you know, very powerful. And, you know, somebody like my father who came on a raft and says, I'm grateful of the fact that I can work, you know, 12 hours a day and make a living for myself. What do you say to people like that? Well, your father came from Cuba, right? Cuba has been under bitter, brutal attack for 60 years, actually, for almost two centuries. Uh, the U.S., uh, back in the 1820s, uh, the rising American Republic regarded Cuba as a ripe fruit that 
the United States should pluck, take over, turn it into another major uh, slave owning state. They realized that they couldn't do it at that time. Britain was too powerful. Uh, John Quincy Adams, the great master strategist, the uh, intellectual father of Manifest Destiny, informed the cabinet. This is around the time of the Monroe Doctrine, for which he was largely responsible, informed the cabinet that we can't do it right now. Britain's too powerful, but over time, we'll become more powerful. Britain will become weaker and Cuba will fall into our hands by the laws of political gravitation, just as an apple falls from the tree. That happened over the century. By 1898, the United States was sufficiently powerful that Britain was no deterrent, and the United States was able to intervene when the Cuban people were liberating themselves from Spain, US was able to intervene to prevent the liberation of Cuba and to turn Cuba into a virtual colony. The way that's usually described in American history is we helped liberate Cuba. It was the opposite. The US intervened to prevent the liberation of Cuba, became a virtual colony, remained so until 1959, when for the first time, Cuba did liberate itself. What happened? Almost immediately, the US went on attack. By late 59, US planes were bombing Cuba from Florida. March 1960, the Eisenhower administration made a secret decision to overturn the government. Kennedy came in, launched the Bay of Pigs invasion. When that failed, Kennedy administration practically went berserk, uh, launched a major terrorist war against Cuba, very serious terrorist war, large part of what led to the missile crisis that almost destroyed us. Also, extremely severe sanctions to prevent Cuban development uh, when Cuba managed some, somehow to survive uh, with Russian support. When the Russian support disappeared, uh, the Clinton administration then uh, enhanced the sanctions, made them harsher. Now we have a time to really strangle it. The fact, the ability, the fact that even, and the, remember when the US imposes sanctions, they are third party sanctions. Everyone has to agree to them or else they're punished. That's what it's like to be the godfather. So the world is totally opposed to the sanctions, almost 100% opposed. You take a look at the votes in the General Assembly every year, uh, 180 to two, United States and Israel. Israel has to vote with the United States, everyone else opposed, but they obey them because you have to. The United States is a frightening country. You don't disobey it. So that means if Cuba wants syringes for uh, uh, vaccines, can't get them from Sweden because that would violate US orders. The very fact that Cuba has survived is an absolute miracle. So yes, you can understand why people flee from it, from the disaster. Uh, it's been a remarkable achievement in many ways. So for example, life expectancy is higher in Cuba than it is in the United States. Well, it's a pretty significant achievement, especially under these horrendous conditions. There's a lot to criticize in the Cuban uh, governmental systems, democratic, repressive in many ways and so on, but you can't divorce it from the context in which it's taken place. What does this have to do with socialism? Absolutely nothing. The core essence of socialism is control by working people over production. That's the most elementary feature of what socialism ever meant. There's no socialism uh, almost anywhere. There's, you look at workers' rights, uh, 
the greater in the United States than they were in the Soviet Union. Uh, the, there are two, there had been two major propaganda agencies in the world. One, the enormous US propaganda system. Another, the smaller but somewhat effective Soviet system. They disagreed on a lot of things, but they agreed on one thing, namely that the Soviet Union and those who was socialist. The Soviet Union insisted on it because it wanted to bring to its own support the moral aura of socialism, even though it was the most anti-socialist society in the world. The United States wanted to call it socialist so that it could defame socialism by associating it with the totalitarian and harsh aspects of Soviet government. Well, under those conditions, people were deluded into regarding that as socialism. It's particularly true in the United States, maybe the freest country in the world and the most deeply indoctrinated. Unlike other countries, the word socialist in the United States is a four letter word. Almost every other country except dictatorships Socialist is like Democrat. Uh, nobody raises any question about being what's called a socialist, which means a moderate social democrat. Uh, communists run elections in our allied countries. Can't imagine it here. This is a deeply indoctrinated country, much more so than others. I think that's a reflection of its freedom. When people are free, you have to make sure that they're under control. If they're not free, you don't care that much. In a very free society like ours, the controls are very strict. Uh, in the educational institutions, in the media, uh, public, uh, uh, the governmental institutions with their own propaganda role, so it's a deeply indoctrinated country. But going back to the questions, what your father felt fled from was not socialism. There was no sign of it in Cuba, fleeing from the miserable conditions imposed by brutal, savage US imperial policy going far back. And we know the reasons. It is a free and open society. One of the good things about the United States we know a lot about US policy because of the relative freedom and declassification and so on. You go back to the 1960s when Kennedy was launching the terrorist war and sanctions, brutal sanctions. Uh, the State Department explained that the uh, basic threat of Castro's Cuba is successful defiance of US policies going back to the Monroe Doctrine, the 150 years in Monroe Doctrine stated US intention to govern the hemisphere, couldn't do it then, but it stated the intention and Cuba was defying it and successfully defying it. That's intolerable. So the hammer struck with force gotta block this. That's been US policy towards Cuba ever since 1959, 1960, intensifying under Kennedy. Same policy for other countries. We're now commemorating uh, the 50th anniversary of the Paris peace negotiations, which formally, though not actually, ended the Vietnam War. Why the US go to war against Vietnam. Well, take a look at the internal documents, early 1950s, same thing. Vietnam might prove to carry out successful defiance of US policies for organizing and controlling Asia. Can't have that. US launched a major war through the 50s, escalating under Kennedy, later Johnson, turning into a utter murderous catastrophe. Can't allow successful defiance. Cuba is a dramatic case of it. 
you learn a lot about the nature of world order and indoctrination and our cultural system and political system if you look at this carefully. Thank you, Professor. Um, it's about that time we've reached the hour, but before we close out, um, on that note of defiance, do you have any final words that you want to impart, particularly on the young people in this room, about what they can do now to participate in defiance and overcoming these systems that we've discussed today? Well, let me just mention the obvious, which we didn't talk about. You are facing issues that have never arisen in world history. You've looked, you're familiar with the latest IPCC report, I'm sure. We have a short period, a couple of decades, maybe, in which we can deal with the urgent issue of destruction of the environment to a point where organized human life will not survive in any recognizable form. There's never been a question like that in human history. There's a parallel question about nuclear war. Are we going to, there is an increasing threat in Asia, China, with regard to China, with regard to Russia, of an increasing threat of nuclear war. That happens, we're finished. Well, it's possible to deal with these things. We know the methods, but under the conditions of currently existing savage capitalism, it's not gonna be possible. Uh, the only ways now that are on the table to deal with the climate crisis are what Secretary Stimson mentioned bribe the rich and powerful who own the economy to see if they'll help. That's not going to work. You have to separate the savage part of capitalism from the amalgam of savage capitalism, at least move back to the kind of capitalism of the Eisenhower period in which you didn't have this extraordinary power of especially finance capital to control the society and crush the population. That's feasible. That may offer us a chance to escape. Then comes the deeper problem of eliminating the utterly dysfunctional, uh, irrational nature of a social and political system designed for increase of profit not social benefit for the general population. That's in the long term, a kind of a death sentence. These are challenges that you face and they're extremely urgent. Thank you, Professor. Let's please have another round of applause for Professor Noam Chomsky. Thank you. You're popular, Professor. Um, I think being at this event today has reminded me, and I believe should remind us all, that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Professor Chomsky is recognized for his fierce intellect and contributions to the realm of academia. But beyond that, I think what makes him so special and in my opinion, one of the greatest thinkers of our time is his unyielding commitment to the advancement and prosperity of humankind. As Princeton students, we occupy a space of immense privilege and opportunity. And therefore, we simultaneously occupy a space of immense duty and responsibility. I urge you all to take steps towards becoming more involved than you already are. We've already heard that the way forward is through cooperation, and groundwork action. You can take steps such as joining campus organizations that are dedicated to this kind of service, such as the Princeton YDSA, 
the Princeton Progressive Law Society, or even just taking time to speak to people who you don't know to build a sense of greater community, harmony, and equity on our campus. Um, for those interested in any of the organizations I mentioned earlier, we actually have uh, tables outside that you can go to to get any more information. Um, with that being said, it's been my absolute pleasure, as long as as well as with Bryce, to serve as your MC for tonight. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys at our future events. On April 7th, we actually have an event uh, called Crossroads of Economics and Social Justice, a retrospective. It'll be April 7th at 5 p.m. Um, you can find flyers outside. Professor Chomsky, thank you so much. Please have a good rest of the day and take care. Let's give him another round of applause, folks. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be with you. Mm -hmm.